Innovation is transforming healthcare and helping tackle unmet medical needs. In 2020 alone, around 5,000 clinical trials were started to investigate and develop new therapies and vaccines. Almost 50% of therapies and development are new substances. With 40% of the pipeline targeting rare disease and groundbreaking cell and gene therapies growing in importance. The number of new active substances approved by the European Medicines Agency in 2020 increased by 80% compared to 2019. The volume of clinical trials has increased in the last five years. For patients, it means a chance to receive a new treatment that has the potential to improve their quality of life, help the management of their disease, or in some cases prolong or save their lives. And there are many promising success stories, bringing benefits not only to patients, but also to their families and healthcare systems. In hematological cancer, CAR-Ts have revolutionized treatment, helping the body fight back against blood cancer cells. And now we can start to look at applying CAR-Ts to the treatment of solid tumors too. Remyelinating therapies have the potential to reverse some of the effects of multiple sclerosis, improving patients' mobility and vision. mRNA technology gave us the first COVID-19 vaccine, and it could be used in the future to fight cancer. We have the ambition of making Europe a world leader in medical innovation. With the right research ecosystem in place, we know we can. And until more patients can benefit from innovative treatments, we won't rest in our search for answers. We won't rest. We won't rest, well, not at least for the next hour and a half, as we have a great lineup of speakers to discuss the question, are current investments in medical research focusing on unmet health needs? Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining from all across Europe. We have a record number of registrants, uh, something approaching 700, I believe. So it's great to see we have so many of you. We have people from governments, from EU organizations, from academia, patient groups are with us, also the pharmaceutical industry, and some healthcare payers have joined us, and members of the press. We hope that you will all contribute to this webinar this afternoon by submitting your questions via the Q&A function button at the bottom of your screen. We'll take as many of those questions as we can. My name is Sue Saville. I'm an independent healthcare journalist, and I'm delighted to be guiding you through this event, looking at exciting innovation that's underway in pharmaceutical research and development and discussing what is needed to make sure that uh, investment continues in unmet medical need. We'll also consider how the new EU pharmaceutical strategy could help make Europe a global hub for science and innovation. All of this on the very day that the FBA 2021 pipeline report has been launched. And to reveal details of this, I'm delighted now to introduce to you Thomas Alvin. He's the Executive Director for Strategy and Healthcare Systems at FBA, where he focuses on patient-centered, outcomes-based and sustainable health systems. So Thomas, what are the headlines then from this year's pipeline report? Thank you so much, Sue, and uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, who has joined. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm very pleased to, to uh, join you today to very briefly introduce the uh, FBR pipeline report. Um, and um, uh, as I hope you can now see on the, on the screen, uh, the report is, is uh, around 200 pages more in total. I will not go through all of them, but just give some of the highlights of what you can find in this report that you will also find uh, at the FBI website. Uh, and uh, the report, I should say, ha have been developed by uh, IQVIA based on open available data, looking at uh, uh, data sources like clinicaltrials.gov, et cetera, expert interviews. And we also have with us uh, Rebecca Cody from IQVIA is online. Uh, so if there are any specific questions about the report, uh, uh, she would be happy to, to, to take them. Um, and uh, the report uh, consists of three main chapters. First, an um, uh, overview uh, of the pipeline, the R&D pipeline of the industry. 
Um, the second one, looking uh, into depth into a few specific uh, areas of innovation, looking at uh, what's the science behind them and what could be the benefits for patients and health systems if these uh, new innovation go through or are successful through the R&D process and get approved and reach patients. And the third one, looking at the final step in that journey from uh, sort of EMA approval to uh, actually coming to patients and how can we work together to make that, to make that possible. Um, looking at the overall uh, pipeline, um, you can see that it's a, it's a very uh, sort of healthy pipeline, clinical trial activity generally going up. There has been some challenges uh, this year uh, because, of, uh, because of COVID, uh, obviously. Uh, and you can see here to the right, um, oncology uh, being a big part of the, of the pipeline, but now also infectious diseases uh, and neurology uh, and many other areas. And around 5,000 clinical trials started only this year in different uh, phases. So phase one, two, and three. Um, on uh, looking specifically at oncology, uh, we can see that, that there are uh, uh, generally high prevalence indications uh, leading, leading the pack, such as uh, non-small cell lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma, ovarian cancer, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but also a, a, a healthy piece of the pipeline being really small indication, low incidence uh, treatments. Um, and beyond oncology, uh, there is, uh, the pipeline is, is uh, dominated by uh, diseases with high societal impact. And now, of course, COVID-19, also HIV. We have uh, neurology, such as Alzheimer's disease, MS, uh, hematology, respiratory diseases. Um, and we can also say that, that, that the pipeline is highly innovative, uh, around half being new substances, um, and uh, we can also see to the, to the um, right that uh, it's now an overweight for a biological uh, medicines uh, compared to a classic small molecule, uh, but also cell and gene therapies gaining in importance. Um, so, so much for the overview, and you will find a lot more slides in the full report. Then we look into eight specific areas of innovation. We look at combination therapies for lung cancer. We look at Alzheimer's therapies. Uh, we look at gene therapies with a focus on hemophilia. Uh, we look at uh, cell therapies with a focus on, on CAR T therapies for, for blood cancers. Uh, we look at therapies against uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is uh, a big disease with a, with a big disease burden. Um, we are looking at uh, re remyelinating uh, therapies for, for MS and other central nervous system diseases. Uh, we look at mRNA vaccines specifically for brain cancer. And uh, we are looking at curative therapies for uh, hepatitis B and HIV. And, and uh, really the, the, um, the horizon of the pipeline report are things in phase two, phase three trials that, that could, if everything goes according to plan, uh, come to health systems in three to seven years. Um, and uh, looking specifically at the gene therapies as an example, uh, you will see that, that it contains uh, information about the disease burden, uh, what's, what's, what does this, uh, disease, mean, uh, disease mean for patients and health systems. Um, and it also looks uh, it, behind the science. So in this case, what is, what is gene therapy and, and how, does it, uh, how does it work? Um, and then uh, for each of these areas, uh, we look into detail, what would it mean for patients, for healthcare systems and societies uh, should these therapies uh, reach, reach patients? And, and obviously uh, hemophilia being a very high burden disease uh, for patients is an orphan disease around 70,000 patients in Europe uh, are affected. And uh, today, uh, they, they, uh, they only have uh, so-called factor eight replacement therapy, which has to be administered intravenously every three to seven days for moderate to severe uh, cases. And uh, uh, of course, the big change here would be a gene therapy actually repairing the faulty genes uh, to make sure that, 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 that the patient's body can themselves 
uh, produce this, this uh, missing protein uh, to avoid bleedings and, and, uh, and, and hemorrhages. And uh, of course, this would mean a huge change for, for patients uh, going uh, from this, this continuously uh, chronic treatment intravenously to uh, a one-off repair of the, of the faulty genes. Um, so it would certainly mean uh, a lot for patients, uh, also for, for, for health systems, many of these treatments uh, having to take place in hospitals. Also, of course, uh, consequences of severe uh, bleedings requiring hospitalization. Uh, all this would, would, would be different uh, if patients could be treated uh, via uh, gene therapies uh, instead. Um, and so we also look at how does the actual pipeline look, uh, what kind of products, uh, what's, what's the kind of time horizon, how many products in development are we, are we talking about? Um, but we can also see looking at the, the, uh, the clinical development in more generally here for, for, for gene therapies, it's not only hemophilia, you can see a number of other indications. Um, and, uh, and you can see to the right, uh, a big chunk of these uh, trials are ongoing in, in the US, uh, a bit smaller part in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and, and this is a pattern uh, that you can see being repeated across several of these uh, areas uh, that we have looked at. Uh, you can see for, for curative therapies for HIV, around 65% uh, of the clinical trials are happening in the United States. Uh, in Europe, it's only about 8%. Um, looking at uh, NASH therapies, around 70% of the clinical trials are, are taking place in, in the US and around 7% in Europe. Uh, so this is a pattern that you can see across several disease areas. Uh, one of the few that we have looked at where, 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 where Europe do have an overweight is the mRNA vaccine uh, technology. Um, so then the final part of the report. So, so, so uh, this type of material you will find for all the eight areas that, that has been investigated in the report. And the, uh, the final section is about uh, how do we provide access to this uh, innovation once, it's, once it's, uh, it's, it's, it's here. And uh, looking at several issues such as evidence and, and assessment. So what type of data is needed to assess the effects of, uh, for instance, of cell and gene therapy uh, in real life and, and uh, to measure its effect uh, in the long run. Uh, how do we collect patient reported data on the outcomes that matter for patients? How do we include that in assessments? Um, also at reimbursement and funding, uh, if we, for instance, such in the example of, of, of gene therapies, if we change from a life course, long treatment, chronic treatment, uh, such as for hemophilia patients to a one-off, uh, sort of very advanced treatment, how do, we, how, how do we adapt payment and financing models to, to match that? Also, of course, healthcare delivery. Uh, if we would get new uh, Alzheimer's treatment, this would require diagnostic pathway with, with uh, including imaging and, 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 and likewise uh, diagnostics to really capture the patients early on uh, in the disease progression. Is that capacity there in, in health systems today? And how can we work together to really collect and access all the data that are needed for clinical trials, research, assessment, and, and patient care? And, and the report contains several interesting case studies on new types of partnerships uh, for making this a reality, including projects through the Innovative Medicines Initiative. So uh, that was really a lightning round uh, of the uh, pipeline report. Uh, obviously, to make all of this happen, uh, you need uh, collaboration and, and you need a sound uh, information base. So we want through this report to, to, to really encourage uh, all healthcare system stakeholders to look at what is coming and how can we come together uh, to plan uh, to make sure that, that, that this innovation uh, not just stays in the lab, but also uh, reaches patients. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and hand back to you, Sue.
Um, Thomas, thank you very much. Questions already coming in. Perhaps I could put one straight to you. Um, it, I had a question here from Moana Bernard asking uh, Thomas, is there a specific focus or analysis on pediatric trials and therapies in this annual report? Yeah, thanks for that question. So, so the answer is uh, no, we have not looked specifically at those uh, type of trials, uh, but uh, it's, it's an interesting suggestion. So we can certainly take that with, uh, with us and because we try to, to update this report uh, at least annually. Thank you. Gosh, so there's some really uh, exciting innovations coming down that pipeline, but, but then some challenges and you touch on that. Uh, the predominance of the US in so many of, of the trials. Looking at some of the data, I noticed that in 2016, Europe's share of clinical trials globally was a third, but in 2020, it's only a quarter with the US taking the lead. So we want to find out then what can be done to uh, help Europe get its predominance back. And indeed, that touches on a question that's come in about that. What can we do? Well, I hope we'll answer that because we've got a great panel of speakers. Let me introduce them to you now. We have Donna Walsh. She's the Executive Director of the European Federation of Neurological associations, EFNA. She trained in journalism, always a good place to start, and she's worked with patient organizations in the neurological sector. She's also a board member at the European Brain Council. Also with us, we're very lucky to have Pierre Delso, Deputy Director General at the European Commission at the Directorate of General for Health, DG Sante. He studied law at Liège and Chicago, and he's worked at the European Commission in a number of responsibilities covering competition, financial services, single market, and the defense and space industries. Also, we have Dr. Paul Stoffels. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Johnson & Johnson, and he spearheads the company's innovation agenda and steers its strategy to make new medicines and technologies accessible in some of the world's uh, most underprivileged communities. In fact, uh, Paul started life as a physician in Africa. So welcome to you all. Now, I'm interested to kick off. What did you make of those headlines that Thomas went through there? What did you make of the report? Donna, what about your response? Were you encouraged by what's in there or concerned about it in any way? Yeah, so thanks, Sue. And I think for me, it's obviously some cautious optimism on my side. So I think by looking at the pipeline, I obviously represent neurology patient groups, and we see that 10% of the pipeline is now populated by R&D in our area. So for me, that's a positive thing, because just a number of years ago, we were seeing a lot of pharma companies closing their doors to neuroscience. And really, it's nice to see that that work has been reinvigorated and is back populating the pipelines again. I think there's a couple of caveats maybe that we need to bear in mind when we look at the pipeline. And the first is that there are over 400 neurological disorders. And when you look at the pipeline, you're maybe looking at a handful of those. So it's not potentially representative of the wider neurology space. And the other thing I think we need to bear in mind when we're looking at a pipeline, and Thomas touched on this in terms of thinking about the challenges and the barriers that are ahead, is that it's not really reflective of what treatments will come to market and will get into the hands of patients. And we've seen that in the area of Alzheimer's disease over recent years, where one clinical trial after another fails. And we have to bear that in mind. And I'd be interested maybe to see a comparison based on earlier pipeline reviews, where we see which of these treatments did actually get to market. And if they didn't, where did they fail? What were the barriers? What were the hurdles that need to be overcome? Because we see a huge failure rate in our area. And so it's one thing to look at the pipeline and feel that sense of optimism, but it's another thing to make sure that those new treatments actually get to market and get to the hands of patients. Yes, thank you. Well, from the pharmaceutical industry, Paul, what's your initial response then to the pipeline report? Are, are you encouraged or perhaps alarmed at Europe's diminishing role in the clinical trials? Well, first on the pipeline itself, I think I'm always amazed, but especially proud to see how many translations of new science happening into applications for patients. Uh, when I started 30 years ago, we had small molecules, then antibodies, some vaccines. If you look now on gene therapy, cell therapy, all these capabilities which have been generated over even the last 10 years, and the ability it gives now to translate basic science into real solutions for patients. That's like, I'm proud. 
but also amazed on how much it takes, like uh, Donna was saying, before you have one particular medicine, which is really makes it to the finish line and makes a significant difference. It's like a huge amount of work goes in there. And of course, many, many failures. And it's that that collective, let's say, investment in all these different technologies eventually gets to one or two or three or a few solutions. And that's what we, of course, need to keep going. On the clinical trials, it's worrying and we can do something about it. We can discuss that further, uh, but it's also following where you can get the fastest result first to the clinic and then to, um, to, to approvals, as well as to an outcome for business because it needs to get a return on investment. And so I think the whole, the whole value chain has to work. And of course the value chain pulls a lot of medicines to the US today because it goes faster and it's more rewarding. Now that should not be discouraging for Europe. So many people need those medicines in the world. And I think in Europe, we can all work together to make sure we restore that balance, but it will take some efforts uh, for uh, the end-to-end -end value chain to, uh, to make it work. Th thank you, Paul. And turning to Pierre Delso, May I ask what's your response then to the pipeline report in the context of the new EU pharmaceutical strategy? It's got a very ambitious objective to make Europe then this central hub for medical innovation. But this, is this realistic in the face of such global competition? Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Thomas for the presentation of the report, but even more important for the report itself, because you have a lot of positive aspects in this report. And I believe that's a very important document. So I. I'm very pleased to see such a document. Now, to, to respond to your question, you know, in Europe, we have always have a tendency to be extremely pessimistic about our situation compared to the rest of the world. You know, we have a tendency to believe that the rest of the world is doing better than we are doing in Europe. But if I look at Europe, and if I look at the report, I still see a lot of positive aspects and positive developments, you know. And we, we should say it, Europe is still an attractive place, you know. And, for, for instance, if I take the question now, we are all, of course, uh, obsessed by the vaccines for very important reasons, but let's not forget all the developments with respect to the vaccines, which took place in Europe. And that's something we need to take into account. So let's, sometimes we, we should stop being so negative about us and look at the positive side. Or I keep saying, you know, always look at the bright side. Of course, looking at the bright side, that doesn't mean that we need to be complacent. And of course, we need to see what can be improved because everything is, not everything is perfect. And as you say, we are in a global competition. So certainly one of the points which already been mentioned are important for me. First of all, I agree, we need probably to try to make sure that a lot of good research lead to actual productions of medicines and vaccines. And that's through the gap between research and the huge investment in research and what we actually deliver on the market is still quite uh, important. And we need to see how we can try to improve that aspect. Second issue, you mentioned the issue of the clinical trials. And that's true. When you look at the figure, it's quite impressive or depressing, if you want to say it from that point of view. You may have heard of the new uh, measures, you know, which has been created by the Commission, which is called Vaccelere, which is actually a European network of clinical trials. And we have just established it now. It's new, just a few, a few days, a few weeks ago. And I can tell you, it has already a huge success. So we have already a lot of... Uh, partners who are willing to be part of this new network. And I believe that's something which is important because that's something which was missing. And in this respect, also one dimension which is important that the children dimension. This network will also be used for you know, testing uh, medication drugs and so on, addressing for, for the children. So again, it's not perfect, but at least we are doing something. We are, by creating this network, we give us the opportunities to improve the situation. On the pharma strategy, I will come back maybe later on this issue, but clearly with the pharma strategy, what we want to do is not a revolution, but to try to improve what exists to make Europe an even more attractive place. And I would stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Pierre, thank you for that. And let me put a question to you directly from uh, one member of our audience. Um, Carol Lanou has asked, why then such a difference in clinical trials between the US and the rest of the world? How is this possible with such a pharma industry in Europe? You, you've touched on that there, the positives about what you just announced, but why the big difference, Pierre? But I just said, because one of the aspects also is that, you know, what's the difference between the, one of the difference between the US and Europe? US is one market, one country. We are still, we are st we are still divided. And let's be clear, so if you talk about health matter, health matter are still a national competence and we are not going to change it. 
But if we have one lesson learned from the crisis, and probably we have many lessons learned from the COVID crisis, that we need more interaction at EU level, we need more cooperation, we need more work between the member states. And so to come back to the question of the clinical trials, that's exactly what we want to do with the new network. It's just creating this network, you know, linking uh, people in different places, linking hospitals in different places, and to use them to do these clinical trials. And again, seeing the first initial responses, of course, it's just the beginning. But if I see, for instance, the number of hospitals which are willing to participate, the number of partners who are willing to participate, even countries which are not uh, EU countries are also part, will be part of this uh, uh, clinical network. So I believe this is a step forward. I don't see, I'm not sure it will work. We'll see anyway. Thank you. Um, and just very briefly, really picking up at some of the points that are coming in, and thank you so much for those. Something I'd like to put to Donna, actually, this might resonate with you. Um, John Bowis is asking, um, was there any reference to, to mental health in the report? Given the comorbidity uh, with so many physical diseases, um, and we're seeking to progress with a more holistic treatment and care with the development of digital health, e-health, mental health, um, distance monitoring, telemedicine and so on. Donna, what do you make of that briefly? Would you like to have seen more on the mental health aspects of health? Yeah, I guess part of this question is probably for Thomas or Rebecca to answer in terms of where mental health is grouped within the pipeline review. But for me, obviously, working in the area of neurology, there's a huge correlation with the efforts in the area of mental health if we want to look at brain disorders as a whole. Um, and I feel that that is definitely something that needs to be taken forward because traditionally, research and development in the areas of brain disorders has been the most difficult, it's been the most complex, it's taken the longest to bring these treatments to market despite the fact that at least one in three people will be living with one of these disorders in their lifetime. These disorders are costing uh, the European economy almost 800 billion euros per year. So there's a real argument to be made around the value of treatment and the value of innovation in the brain space with the mental health and the neurology side of things. And certainly, you know, 10% for neurology, even in the pipeline, is nowhere near reflective of the burden of those diseases together. So at the start, whilst I said, you know, it's cautious optimism, there's still a lot of room for maneuver and there's a lot of way to go if we're going to catch up with some of those other bigger prioritized communicable and non-communicable diseases. Well, well, thank you. And let's take a look now at some of those issues um, to understand about investment. Is it really being targeted at the unmet medical need? Other comments coming in, Elizabeth Zanon says, the pipeline for cardiovascular disease looks fairly dry. Um, are we really addressing the, the key areas when cardiovascular disease, of course, is a leading cause of disease burden around the world? But let's just think about fo focusing on unmet medical need. Who defines it? Who decides? Do we have a, a common definition? Um, perhaps again, Donna, what do you think from the patient's perspective? Who defines unmet medical need? I think this is the million dollar question, Sue. And I think actually we could all answer that question, but we would all give you a very different answer because I think it depends on the area you're working in, your personal experience, the expertise that you bring to the table. So I think in that sense, if we were all sat together in a room and you asked everybody what did they see was the biggest area of unmet need in healthcare today, you might get 250 different answers. But I think from my side, we have to be careful about narrowing the scope of unmet need too much. I know in the pharmaceutical strategy, we talk about rare diseases, we talk about neurodegenerative diseases, we talk about childhood cancers. And absolutely, I don't think any of us are going to disagree that these are huge areas of unmet need in our communities without treatments in many cases, never mind without cure. But even within EFNA as a neurology umbrella of 20 different disease areas, there are other groups that you know, are not mentioned there, but would also have huge issues in the area of unmet need, no treatments, no cures, relatively little research and investment, and not rare diseases, by the way, you know, diseases that cover large parts of our population. But because of lack of awareness, because of stigma, because of lack of interest, we're not seeing those prioritized. And I'm thinking of things like ME-CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, restless leg syndrome, diseases like this that you never really see in terms of the pipeline, in terms of these sort of lists of unmet needs. And my fear is that if we decide these are the unmet needs and we list four or five disease areas, that diseases like that not just will stagnate, but will actually be completely left behind. 
And I think we have to think about what we saw in the introductory video, where we saw you know, advances in one areas that can actually lead to advances in progress in other areas. And for me, yes, we can define unmet need, but I also think we need to think about how we can efficiently and effectively use our limited resources to address areas that can be scaled up, can be rolled out and can bring about progress in other, in other areas. And this we see a lot of in the field of neurology. You know, we're learning more and more about how the brain works. We're seeing the connections between different disorders. And even though they may be diverse in their manifestation, the underlying sort of pathophysiology can be very, very similar. And we know, for example, if you address neuroinflammation, for example, you can address a lot of neurological disorders. If you address pain, chronic fatigue, you're addressing the symptoms of many chronic conditions. So I think for me, patients have to be in the lead in terms of defining what is unmet medical need, but we also need to think about how we then address those and how in doing so, we can bring the most value to the most patients. But thank you, Donna. Gosh, that's, that's, there's a lot of ideas in there. And may I just say to the audience, if you're going to put questions in, could you do them in the Q&A and not in the chat so we can, uh, we can keep up with you? There's some great questions coming in. But I want to turn now to um, Pierre. What about the new EU pharmaceutical strategy? H how does that address the areas of unmet medical need? And does setting policy then drive which areas research goes into? First of all, on the pharma pharmaceutical strategy, as you know, it's, we, are, we, have we have launched a process and we, we want to come up with you know, proposals in 2022 and probably modification of uh, two directives, which are extremely important, of course. But I would like to say a few things about uh, the pharma strategy and uh, pharmaceutical strategy, which I believe are also linked to what you are saying. Nobody has a magic solution. You know, if we had a magic solution, we would, you know, everybody would use it. So we know it's a complex issue, and we know that the problems that you want to address are actually probably deserve several responses and several elements of responses. So that's the first message. The second message for me, which I believe is also important, that as a commission, we fully understand that we need to listen to stakeholders. It's important that we listen to the patients. It's important also that we listen to the industry. You know, we, we need to understand what are exactly, because as Donna just said, you know, patients should be, of course, the key, because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that patients, that everybody, you know, will get access to affordable medicines everywhere in Europe. That's clear, that's the objective. But of course, we know that also in this context, we need to talk to the industry. You know, it's not one size fits all. We need to have everybody around the table and to make sure. So we really want, we really want to have an inclusive process for this because we believe it's important. Third element, third message, which I believe also is important. We have legislation which have been working not so badly. Let's be honest, it's not perfect, but certainly we have achieved something with our legislation. So it's clear that we do not want, we do not want to completely change everything. So, but we, we are certainly agree that we need to do targeted revision and to try to improve the situation. Last element, which I believe also is important in this context, and you said it also, one dimension which has changed also with the COVID situation is probably the fact that we realize that we need to have what we call open strategic autonomy. We believe it's important also that we look at what we can do in Europe. I'm not saying we should close the borders, that's not my point, but the point is certainly we need to see how we can be, build more resilient uh, systems in Europe, health systems in Europe, because that's also something which is fundamental. And so that's part of the element that we want to discuss with all stakeholders, because we believe this is, you know, it should be a collective work, all of us together working in the same direction to try to achieve what is exactly the purpose of what we're discussing today, how to make sure that we have more innovation, more research, and more important, more treatments for unmet need in Europe. Thank you very much. A lot of strong points in there. Uh, I want to turn to Paul then, what, what, what you make of that and how the pharmaceutical industry itself assesses unmet medical needs. I'm interested, do you um, work backwards from what the patients need or do you come up with a lovely substance and, and apply it uh, to a condition? How, how does that work? How do you prioritise? It's, it's a good question. So and what we typically do is connecting good science with, with the medical need. And so we quantify the it, it's years of life. How, can, how much life can we create, for example, survival in oncology of cure in cancer patients 
or quality of life, how much better. We have in between us and the patient, we have a regulator where we have to show that we show value to, to that we are better than existing therapies, sometimes non-inferior, which is equal, but, but that doesn't work very well anymore in, in, our, in our environment. We need to have better therapy. So you always have to focus on quality of life um, years of life, but also many times it could also be simplification and reduction of cost to the healthcare system. So if you have a very simple type of administration, which keeps people out of the hospital and therefore reduce significant cost, that's a, another way of uh, addressing medical need. But the regulators and the payers are, of course, a big gateway for access to people. But on the other hand, you 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 need the passion of researchers and physicians. Yeah, getting to a transformational innovation with the real impact of life, it always takes between 10 up to mostly 20 years. So it's a continuation of seeing, having a vision on what could ultimately be transformational for patients, which typically brings this new innovation. So it is is a color, it, it's it's a combination years of life, quality of life, but also availability of science and people who have a passion who take it through the years to make it happen. And, and that determines for us, where do we invest? I'm, I'm picking up then on that in investment. We've had uh, some lovely questions coming in there. Um, one saying that there's a huge knowledge gap in pharma and we see it in this crisis now. So asking how our research priorities decided was the impact, for instance, Paul, of public funding? How is the divide between public and private funding? Uh, and then perhaps we'll, we'll ask Pierre about the lack of European coordination. So just so straight back to Paul, and if you would, wouldn't mind all keeping your answers fairly concise. Yes. So much coming in, it's fantastic. Yeah. Why but, then? Uh, what about the public funding and any balance uh, there? I think the public funding is extremely important in academic research, where the basic new science is being generated, which is the building, which is the, the foundation of future new medicines. And I think if there's anything needed, it's absolutely continue to strengthen that research. And then public funding is very much needed where there is no good market pool. Yeah, and Donna was talking about dementia, Alzheimer. For example, it's extremely long, it's very challenging, and it's too, too complicated for take up for one company to do it. So collaboration is needed. Like AMR, antimicrobial research, uh, sorry, uh, resistance, there was no market pool because the prices are so low that no new innovation were come, came in. There again, collaboration, public funds, how can, you, how can you drive it? The vaccines today, the speed, it had to happen so fast that public money was needed to get with industry capabilities and money to make it happen. Uh, but so it's, it's a mix in all different situations. There are fields which go very fast without public money, but there are very many fields which need public money. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Well, let's put that over to Pierre then about coordination then on a European level. Um, Pierre, the EU pharmaceutical strategy you've mentioned talks about tailoring incentives to stimulate innovation in unmet health needs. So how do you go about that? Paul's uh, and Donna have mentioned dementia, Alzheimer's, AMR. Each therapy area seems to have different needs in terms of how that's addressed. So how can that be covered in European policy? First of all, I would like to say that I fully agree with what Paul says, just said uh, for the moment. I believe it's analysis of the way where, where you need a combination of public funding for some aspects, and you need, of course, a private funding as, you know, just playing its role, I would say. And co to come back to what he said also, you know, and to come back also to your question, if you look at what we are doing now, we have public funding, you know, we have Horizon Europe, we have now a very important program for the first time, EU for Health, you know, which is quite a substantive amount of money, which is there. But again, we want this, and to come back to your question about the coordination, we consider those, those are tools, you know, for the member state at, at the end of the day for the patient. Because again, let's not forget, we are in an area where the competence is for the member state. So what we want to do with the research and what we want to do with eu for health is to try to come up with concrete actions which will be important. But let's be also very clear. I don't believe that eu for health should be there to please everybody. We cannot give, you know, spread the money across and just giving a small amount of money to everybody. 
we know that if we want to be efficient with this amount of money, we need to focus on some priorities. Again, I'm not saying as uh, Pierre Delso are going to decide on those priorities. We will do it collectively. But it's clear that if we really want this money to be useful, we need to focus on a certain number of priorities. We already know some of them. You know, you know that the Commission has already identified cancer as one of the priorities. And of course, you know, some of the measures that we are proposing for cancer will have also an effect for cardiovascular uh, diseases, because, you know, if you drink less alcohol, you know, it's good also for other type of disease. But anyway, so cancer is certainly one of the priorities. AMR, which has just been mentioned by Paul, is also something on which we are working a lot, because this is a kind of area where you don't have private investment and you need, for, or not at least enough private investment, and so we need more at the public level. But again, Coordination, yes, we will do coordination. And EU files, from that point of view, will be a very important element because EU files will be the, the, the place where member states, stakeholders will discuss on the program, on, decide on the work program and where to invest this money. So to some extent, we will force cooperation on the main priority uh, for the member states. Thank you very much, Pierre. And Donna, there's a question come in, I think um, might be something for you about one side of the unmet needs is certainly the drugs and therapies, but what about the other side, the patient convenience, like for the elderly and adherence therapies, um, those sort of issues. And, and does this play into how you make those um, investment decisions, what you would like to see in terms of the value then that the medicines bring to society, as the question indicates there, the, the wider value that is added uh, when medicines can make such a difference to patients' lives and indeed wider society, Donna? Yeah, I, th I think so, because what we're talking about in the strategy is that we are going to incentivize innovation in areas of greatest unmet need. But then we need to define not just what are unmet needs, but what is innovation. And I think if you talk to patients, very often innovation doesn't necessarily mean a big blockbuster cure or a paradigm shift in terms of how we treat diseases. But it is often something very small, as, as the, the person posing the question there has said. You know, it's maybe changing the mode of delivery on a specific type of treatment to improve patients' overall quality of life. Clinically, maybe makes little or no difference, but actually in terms of quality of life, in terms of functionality and so on, that can really make a huge difference to people affected. So I think we need to think about both sides of the coin when we're looking at this. And, and I saw another question or comment in the, the Q&A related as well saying, you know, surely unmet need is in areas of biggest burden. I mean, again, I, I don't disagree with that, but I do feel we have to balance that up in terms of looking at unmet need in areas where there's no great commercial interest. And that doesn't necessarily mean the conditions with the biggest burden or the biggest mortality, because in that case, there tends to be a lot of commercial interest in that sphere. So we also need to think about these neglected low priority diseases where there is no commercial interest, where the burden actually is maybe misunderstood, but is relatively big and seeing what we can do in that space. So I think it's a very nuanced um, type of conversation that we need to have with all of the stakeholders. But I also agree with Pierre that we can't do everything. We need to prioritize and we need to see that those priorities can have a knock-on effect in other areas. And, and in terms of setting those priorities, Paul, uh, what about the pharmaceutical industry? Just can you clarify for us what role incentives play uh, in terms of helping you decide exactly where to invest in R&D? Well, in incentives, government incentives, uh, as I said earlier, where to invest in R&D is, is, I don't think it drives us. I, absolutely not. It, it helps us in areas where we can't make progress on our own, yeah? And so we worked with IMI, for example, with the Innovative Medicines Initiative on collaborations on, on dementia, on Alzheimer, biomarkers, clinical trials, and their uh, government incentives with the EU helped to set up the system to, to decrease the cost, accelerate time, and get us faster to a result. Uh, uh, Pierre was saying on AMR, it will help us. But when you get to cancer, it's basic research, it's clinical trial networks, it's biomarkers, it's the regulatory pathway. And so incentives, um, I think it's it's evaluating the value, the, the pipeline, not the pipeline, but the value chain from the science to the market and see where or do we have to make sure that the, the, the challenges are taken out, yeah? And I must say, EMA, for example, was a great, you know, is, is an incredible help for Europe now as a central agency to approve medicines for the whole of Europe, because 
that was lacking 10 years ago and now it's like equal almost to the fda almost at the same speed and very helpful in accelerating science so looking at the big things in the whole in the whole value chain where are the gaps and if, and step by step addressing them one very important one is is also digitization and electronic medical health, uh, records yeah um to to move into fast clinical trials and being able to to access people and, and and much faster digitization of the healthcare system is going to also drive the possibility for accelerating. So it's in analyzing the value chain and making sure we address the hiccups, the, the challenges, and, and and make sure it works faster and better. Uh, thank you. Well, Pierre, what, what, what do you make of that? And what about the incentives framework and indeed the intellectual property, the IP framework that needs to be there in regulation to encourage the right investments in Europe? What do you think about Europe's IP framework at the moment compared to competitors? Before responding to your question, I'm sorry not to always to follow what you asked me to say. But again, I would like to follow on what Paul says about digitalization, which I believe is something which is extremely important, which is taking place. But again, there, as Europe, we need to do better because, of course, digitalization is taking place at national level. But we need also to create what we want to do, this European data space. We believe this is something extremely important because, again, to some extent, it's a similar issue as the issue of the clinical trials. You know, what we want to do with the clinic, by creating a network, we want basically to work at European level and to have data from all across Europe. It's exactly the same for digi digitalization. If we are not able to do it, you know, at European level, if we are not able to benefit from it, we will be lacking uh, data, which will be extremely important for science and for development. So from that point of view, I believe that dimension is also extremely important and will be even more important in the future. And then before moving to your question, and I will come to your question, don't be afraid, I would like also to, to follow on one of the questions or remarks which has been made in the chat or the Q&A question. It's clear that we need also when we will be out of it, and I hope one day we'll be out of it, when we'll be out of this crisis, we need to learn also the lesson of the crisis. I'm not talking about, you know, importance of health and so on, which is true, of course, but we need also to learn what we have done well and maybe not done so well in the crisis. But again, if you look at the positive aspect, you know, EMA, for instance, has been able to speed up its regulatory process, its post approval process. That's something which is important. And we need to see how we can do better even in the future if needed. You know, the cooperation also between industry and EMA has been developed, which is also facilitating the approval process. So we need we need to take that into dimension when we will be preparing, you know, the pharma legislation outside, of course, the COVID situation, but just for more generally for all kinds of diseases. Now, on the question of IP, IP is of always a very tricky issue, of course, and it's clear that, uh, you know, there is always a fine line to, to draw. You know the official position, and this is a position that certainly we want to defend. We have an IP system which is not so bad, so bad because we need to maintain incentive for companies to continue to invest in research. So we need to make sure that there is an appropriate framework which is there to make, to make sure that investment in uh, uh, innovation continues to take place because there is a possibility to be protected by an uh, appropriate IP system. On the other hand, and uh, uh, we need also to look what we can do to facilitate, and I insist on this, facilitate the use of, you know, uh, protection of uh, rights by others. So in other words, we need to look at, we can put into place some kind of facilitation mechanism to facilitate maybe the license of those IP rights across the board, more maybe more easily than it is for the moment. So I'm not talking about the compulsory license, let's be very clear. I'm just talking about mechanisms that we could try to establish to facilitate this kind of licensing. And actually, that's also something that we are trying to do in the context of the COVID crisis. We are looking at this. And so we have to see whether we can also learn from this experience and to see whether we can replicate outside of this situation. Thank you. Paul, I'd, I'd like to put to you something that's just, is coming in as well about um, looking at where you're uh, targeting. A uh, question has come in about the, the endpoints. Should patients be more involved in setting those endpoints um, for, for your research and development? 
Well, there's, um, there's the, say, the biological endpoints, the medical endpoints, but in many of the trials we do now, there is the patient outcome uh, who is con a big contributor to evaluating the, 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 the benefit of, of new medicines, of new interventions. So it's very important, and it's more important in, in like, uh, neurological and, and uh, psychiatry diseases and diseases where, where people, the feeling of people are also in, in, um, in heart failure, in, in metabolic diseases. Uh, the patient outcome is so important as part of the full evaluation that people should be part and are part of establishing that. At, le at least patient organizations in certain areas, directly uh, patients are involved. So it is a very important factor on, uh, on, on outcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question coming in um, to, to put to, to Pierre. Uh, can you please anticipate what changes the pharmaceutical strategy will bring to advance ATMPs? One of the initiatives mentioned says it proposes to revise the pharmaceutical legislation, adapt to, uh, to sorry, to adapt to cutting edge products and be tailored, uh, provide tailored incentives for innovation. So uh, what about that? Yeah. You know, I just told you that we want this pharmaceutical strategy to be an inclusive process in which we will be listening to everybody. So that's, a, I'm not going to tell you now what will be the exact content of our proposal, because at this stage, as I said, I don't know what will be the final proposal that we are going to make as a commission. So we are looking, of course, at all issues. We will, you know, and if I can give you an encouragement to all of you, is don't hesitate to participate in all our consultation process. Don't hesitate to come with, you know, with suggestions, with ideas. Again, we are not doing this for us. We are doing it for you, for everybody, you know, for all citizens in Europe, for industry and so on. So we really need to have, to, to have your participation and your ideas. But again, of course, let's be very clear, not all ideas will be part of the, of the proposal that we, we are going to put on the table. But, and we don't have much time because also something we believe it's important. We really want these uh, proposals to be made in 2022, which may sound far away, but actually it means that we have only a few months actually to focus on this and to look at, you know, what could be the possibilities uh, included in this uh, pharma strategy. Uh, Pierre, then can I just follow up briefly and I'll ask you to be fairly brief if, if I may, because there's so much to get through. There's a lovely question coming um, from Elaine. I understand that the European health data space will be subjected to the rules of GDPR. So how can we avoid continued fragmented responses to data which prevent cross-border data sharing and clinical trials across the border, as well as the secondary use of data? Um, what, what's your take on that? First of all, I don't want to monopolize the, 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 the panel, you know, uh, you, you, you have other speakers on the panel. But on, on, on that question, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, repeating a bit myself. It's clear, of course, GDPR rules will be applicable. It's clear. We are not going to create something which, you know, which will uh, contravene the GDPR rules because they are too important and we know all the sensitivities, especially if we talk about, you know, medical data, which are extremely important. But on the other hand, what we really want is to find a way to, to make use of those data in a way which does not infringe GDPR uh, rules, but on the other hand, brings also elements of data which could be important for research. Again, you know, I believe, and talking to scientists, the fact that you have access to a huge amount of data using, you know, information which exists in all 27 member states gives you a huge potential to develop, you know, innovative research and so on. So I believe, you know, that's something on which, of course, we, we are working on also. We are preparing a new legislative proposal. We have already quite a lot of exchanges and discussion, you know, and that's something on which we hope to come up with a good result. But again, we need your help also to find solution on that. Uh, and thank you. So, Paul, what about, uh, what's your take? You've, you've trained in Europe and in America. You've got an understanding. What's the difference then between access to data in Europe and indeed in America, briefly? I think America, of course, is one nation. Yeah, uh, it is easier than uh, than than Europe, but therefore no better always. Um, but I think people have to understand that uh, sharing their data might benefit themselves very much. Yeah. So we are working in the U.S. with a system where if you are a cancer patient, if you can benefit from the, the from the from the output the the data of half of the U.S. population in your perspective based on how you were going to get to a better outcome in a, with a very specific cancer and certain mutations, then at that moment, it helps you. 
So we have to learn people that it's not just take, we take your data, we'll give back. Yeah. And so we have to have data should be take and give back. Give and take is always the deal you have to do with people and uh, with everybody. And that's where we're making it clear that the identified data can help to solve serious diseases, but even more identified data can help to solve so if you if you are if you're open and if you explain well then i think uh, we should of course protect against any misuse but at the same time it should serve the progress of uh, of health and especially for individuals but also for uh, families and people mm -hmm. thank you so on that collaboration point donna what about how the each of the individual countries has their own assessments their health technology assessment htas so when each country is looking at the right criteria and they look at their own situations it, it, it does it vary a lot across europe and is more collaboration needed um, at a european level yeah absolutely and i think you know as as ethna we've been supportive of more eu cooperation on hta for that particular reason um to speed up as well uh, how quickly we can get products onto the market and well not onto the market but into the hands of of patients I, we did some research in the past on patient involvement in health technology assessment looking at a number of countries across europe to really understand how the patient evidence was actually being used in the final decision making process and what we found was whilst there are i guess in some countries quite sophisticated processes for involving patients in health technology assessment at the end of the day the evidence that was being put forward by those patient representatives was really having very little impact on the final decision that was being taken and that's because it's one thing to generate evidence but it's another thing to actually have the tools to be able to integrate that evidence into the decision making process. And this is what we are always struggling with as patient organizations is we can generate the evidence, we can bring the testimonies, but the clinical scales, maybe the tools that we're using, the algorithms for HTA aren't set up to be able to take that patient relevant information and to incorporate that into the decisions that are being taken. So one of the conclusions of that piece of research was actually maybe we need to take a step back from HTA, not put all of our eggs in the HTA basket, but actually making sure, and this goes back to what Paul was saying earlier, that patients are involved from the very start of the research and development process so that we're sitting together with all stakeholders, understanding the unmet needs, looking at the clinical trial methodology, looking at the endpoints, deciding what sort of patient reported outcomes and patient relevant outcomes we are going to gather in the research and development phase, because then you have evidence that comes to HDA that is already patient centered. And I think that's really important. And we also need to have more patient involvement in early dialogues. So we see a lot of discussion between patients and industry. We see a lot of discussion between industry regulators and payers. But we don't often see all of that stakeholder engagement happening at once. And I think that is a piece of work that needs to happen, that the patients need to be embedded from the very start. And then the HTA dimension loses a little bit of its importance, because right now we're trying to be advocates in the HTA process, where really HTA is not about advocacy. It's about assessing evidence and looking at whether these um, treatments should be reimbursed. So Thank I think you. for us, we need to be involved from the very start. Lovely. And of course, what you're saying there is, is very important in the cell and gene therapies that we saw in the pipeline report, exciting innovations and advances um, coming, coming ahead. But uh, for Paul, though, what, what with these changing treatment paradigms for patients and the challenges that they present to healthcare systems, what needs to change in terms of new financing models or regulation with this innovation that's coming down the line that could bring so much benefit to patients? Yeah, there, it, if it goes to ultra orphan type of diseases, which now can be solved by gene therapy, and there are several thousand which are there in purview, uh, in one another way, there needs to be a mechanism to, to give the incentive to do the research, to get to the outcome. And that means that financing mechanisms for for the for the result, which is the gene therapy or the CAR T or others, needs to be there in order to, in the end, get access. Yeah? If you look at, for example, the CAR T therapies, which are now, which were highlighted um, in the presentation, um, we worked for for twenty years on multiple myeloma, yeah? and so all we, we got from two years survival to four to six to eight years survival, different combinations. 
and suddenly you get to a type of therapy which results in a cure. Yeah? And, and that is, of course, transformational, a one-time therapy which takes out a whole challenge but creates many, many years of life. So new payment systems for that one-time therapy with cures of cancer are needed and different thinking in the healthcare system because they take out all the costs but give life to the to the to people. So it's in gene therapy in this very specialized transformational therapies. They will be become mainstream if we find good ways to to uh, to reward for them. They are also very complicated to administer. So we need new distribution systems uh, for CAR T. It's vein to vein. We pick up your cells. You bring them to our labs. We bring them back to you. Totally different than uh, uh, it's fantastic. But we all need to work together, healthcare system, governments, payers, in order to make them accessible to people. And that's uh, what we're working very hard on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Pierre, you touched on the, uh, the situation the last year. I don't want to dwell too much on the pandemic, but I'm, I'm wondering what lessons all of you see in uh, the last year, what, what things can be learned from COVID and the pandemic that would really help take this forward in terms of in investment in, in Europe. Um, uh, Pierre, what's, what's your take on, on uh, some brief lessons learned? I'm sure many lessons will have to be learned from this, that's clear. But one lesson, I'm not sure everybody will like it, but let's be very clear. I know there is a lot of criticism about the vaccination and the vaccines in Europe. But let's also be very clear, without the action at EU level, a lot of people in Europe will simply not have access to vaccine now. I know that people are complaining that they don't have fast access to the vaccine, but not fast enough. But let's be clear, without the European action, nothing would have happened, at least in most member states, nobody would have access to the vaccine. So that I believe that's something, a very important lesson, that by working together, all the member states with European Commission, we have been able to achieve something which will, was not easy to achieve. And if I take the lesson for the vaccine, I believe it's true also for other elements, which, you know, as a part of uh, treatments and medicines and so on. Second element, which I be, second lesson also, which I, we've learned, and I already touched upon it. We need also to be more resilient in Europe. It's clear that you know everybody remembers the situation in which we were, you know, uh, not so not so long ago. Even now, even now, we realize that for some very important um, raw material for the vaccines, we are dependent from the rest of the world. So again, I'm not saying we need to repatriate everything in Europe. That's not my point. It's not feasible and it's not logic. But certainly, we need to build enough resilience to make sure that we're able to cope the challenges. And again, this is true for the vaccine, the COVID situation, but that's true also for other cases. I believe that's the third element. And third element also, which, you know, because again, you know, vaccines were developed very quickly, of course, on the basis of technologies which has been there and so on. But it's clear that when we work together, we are able to, do, to, to be more efficient and also by putting enough money on the table, because money in that whole situation is important. And maybe one last lesson, and we have not yet touched upon it, but we need to get ready for the next crisis. So we, we, we believe that, you know, as you know, we also want to, to present this uh, so-called ERA uh, proposals in new authority. We believe it's also something which is important because we need to anticipate. And that's certainly one last lesson of the crisis is the fact that we need to anticipate more and to be more ready for the future. I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, Donna, what about you? Very briefly, what, what lessons do you feel have been learned from the pandemic? I think exactly the same. I mean, I think when the political will is there, when the money is on the table, when there's a sense of emergency and urgency, things can be done. Uh, and this is something, you know, that we've been really trying to push in the neurology space because we discovered Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis in the 1800s, you know, the early 1900s. And we're sat here 200 years later, we have no cure and we have no treatments for some of these disorders. And yet the numbers are growing. We're talking about one in two people potentially having a neurological disorder in their lifetime. I mentioned the socioeconomic costs earlier, increasing um, numbers of people dying from these disorders in our area, actually in neurology. We've seen a 40% increase in deaths attributable to neurological disorders in the last 30 years. We're living longer. We are also living these sort of modern lifestyles and the environment in which we live, we're seeing this explosion of chronic diseases. And I think if we could take what we've learned from this infectious diseases, communicable diseases, pandemic, 
and apply it in the area of chronic diseases where people are dying, but it's a, a simmering emergency, I guess, slightly under the surface, then I think we can go a long way. And if we can see that sense of urgency in investing in research and flexible regulation in new financing models and, and really making that commitment to drive change, then we can go a long way. Thank you. Well, Paul, uh, one of the points put by one of our participants, um, John Boris asks, given the really remarkable speed of the research um, development and authorization we've seen with the, the COVID vaccines, can we hope for comparable speed of outcomes with other diseases and disorders? Do you see this in the pharmaceutical strategy? Is this something that as a lesson you would take forward from the pandemic, Paul? Yeah, I want to add to what Donna was saying is, is diseases like Alzheimer, which are such a disaster in the world for many, many people, they should get on a different pace. Yeah? And we have shown now that we can do it. The challenge there is the science. We, we have some ideas on how to get there. We need to accelerate. But going back to COVID, uh, it was an extreme achievement from not just from industry, from society, from governments, from regulators, from all working all together to prepare this, to finance this, and to work together on extreme large clinical trials in record time to, to make this happen. The learning is, yeah, on preparedness is, we, we were working on this since 15, 20 years. We had at the Anson j, &J for 10 years, and we have been in Zika, in Ebola, we have been in HIV, we have been in so many areas, influenza, it never happens, but you know in the background that this was going to come. And in the end, it's the new technology investments of mRNA, but also adenovectors and production mechanisms, which led to enable us now within one year to get to the result. And by the end of the year, we'll deliver a billion vaccines. Only possible with long-term investments in science, long-term investments in, in industrial capabilities. And what Pierre is saying, we need to get more resilient because hopefully this is the last time but most probably not we always expected influenza from 1918 would be back we were not we would not be prepared for the next one so let's go after it uh, we all prepare for war the war hopefully never happens world war three but we are not prepared for this uh, massive virology infectious disease challenge yeah. Thank you. And I think just there's so many points coming in and it is lovely. We're going to collate some of your questions and I hope we might be able to get some responses to you later. There's so much good, good material. Uh, perhaps just though to draw our thoughts to a conclusion, if I could ask each of our speakers to, to sum up in a way, um, I'd like to know what you think your vision would be of a successful pharmaceutical strategy in the EU. Um, how would we measure its success in a few years? Donna, what, what would you say? Well, I think that the pharmaceutical strategy on paper is a pretty comprehensive document. So for me, it's about ensuring that we can implement that in reality in the real world. And I like the fact that it is very much patient centred. I mean, it explicitly states it's a patient centred document. It is going to work with different stakeholders. It is going to work across sectors and it is going to work across borders. And for me, if we can make what's on that piece of paper reality, then I think it will have been a success. Thank you, Pierre. What, what does good look like in terms of implementing the EU pharmaceutical strategy, do you think? But Donna has said it, Donna has said it actually, I fully agree, of course, with her. That, you know, I believe the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical strategy in itself is a very ambitious document. The challenge now is not to just to, to have it as a document, but to make it a reality. And it will be a success if actually because of the pharmaceutical strategy, we have more and more people being uh, cured in Europe and uh, you know, being treated in Europe for many diseases. And you might mention, for instance, Alzheimer's. This is a very important. We know it's there. So we need to do something. You know? we, so we, the measure of success will be you know, the number of people who basically will be better treated in Europe because of this. Thank you. Paul, what's uh, the industry's take on what a, a good, what good would look like for an EU pharmaceutical strategy in practice? Well, I think for me, two things. On the one hand, that's what Pierre and, and Donna were saying, is also it, the outcome. What can we do for patients? Because that will drive the success of our industry. But at the same time, it's not just about our industry, uh, pharmaceutical. It's the academia, the biotech industry, the pharmaceutical industry. It will be the economic and, and benefit to Europe would be huge. And also the talent which can work there, the science which can be done at universities in biotechs in, in, in industry. It's such an attractive place for people to work and to create added value for society, which is very unique. You know, 
you're not producing cars, you're producing life. And don't say cars is not exciting, but producing life is, is in my opinion, as a physician, much more exciting. But it's the two things. It's the outcome to patients. Can we solve Alzheimer's? Can we solve critical diseases? And it's the economic tissue we are building in the whole society as a very solid pillar for, for Europe to, uh, to build a future on. Well, thank you. What a positive note. Well, thank you so much to all our speakers for all your insights and your contributions. Um, there's some messages coming in saying what an interesting debate you, you, you've put together there. So thank you so much. I'm really excited that we have the ear of DG Sante here to help carry your ideas back directly into the European Commission and, and to think about getting investment into the most pressing areas of unmet medical need. So thank you so much to our, our speakers. We're going to turn now to seeing a little bit more about what the audience make of some of the key issues. We have a poll. And if uh, I could ask all the audience members out there, all nearly 700 of you, uh, we're going to run a poll now, which is going to uh, ask you one question. It's looking at the pipeline report, which says that it looks into all areas where stakeholders can collaborate to more, make sure that innovation reaches patients um, where they most need it. So could I ask you, be ready to, to vote, please, which one of these key areas would you be most interested in to know more about? Are we seeing that on the screen? Yes, there's a poll coming up. Would you tick one of those, please? Adapting regulatory pathways. Would it be developing new ways of valuing and rewarding innovation? Perhaps that point we touched on about creating new financing models. Or is it more important that the evolving way services are delivered to reflect new approaches to treatment? Or what about enabling real world data to be captured and used to enable innovative care, as was touched on with the European health data space? So we'll just let that run for a few seconds. Um, and I'd like to see the panelists can't vote, so you don't get a say, uh, but we'll hold that just for a few seconds to see how many are coming in. Um, and then very shortly, we'll have a result on that to see which of these key areas you actually think uh, would be of most interest to try to see how stakeholders um, can collaborate and help take this forward. I'm wondering with my tech team behind, if we're ready, do we already have any results? Could we perhaps run that poll? Let's see if the answers are in. Ah, oh, interesting. So fairly evenly spread, but definitely in the lead, enabling real world data to be captured and used to enable innovative care. So that's uh, something very interesting to, to take forward and very much food for thought about how this can go forward. So with us to take stock of that poll result and indeed of the entire discussions which have been so informative and so interesting. I was very struck by Pierre's um, point right at the beginning. There's no magic solution. It's a complex issue. Well, the uh, now let me introduce to you Natalie Moll. She's FPS Director General. Natalie, what did you make of all that? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sue, and I, I love it because I'm a scientist, right? So I love the period of the year when the pipeline review comes out because I just get into it and I, I get very excited about the possibilities that we have um, of changing, changing diseases, changing progression of diseases and ultimately changing pe people's lives. And, and uh, I think uh, Paul said it, it's, it's a question of we work in the area of making life better, making life longer, making life more healthy. Um, what, I, what I thought I would do, if I can, is show one slide that really stuck with me, um, if I can, I don't know if, if that's possible. Um, and it was just a slide that for me summarized the whole, um, the whole of the pipeline review. No, I can't. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just walk you through it. So basically, we had the the science, the areas of science. So the areas of oncology, hematology, the metabolic disorders, central nervous system disorders, and infectious diseases. So these are the areas where you know where we're really making incredible strides. Um, the incredible innovations that are coming to address the challenges in those areas, whether it's combination therapies, CAR T, so um, gene therapies, mRNA vaccines, not just for COVID, but for, for other things, um, gene therapies, uh, anti-amyloid therapies, um, curative antivirus. Oh, somebody else has the slides. Isn't that great? <laughs> I shouldn't even have to do it. Um, so you can see there that middle. So this is what's coming. This is what we have to, uh, what is at the tip of our fingers. But of course, if we don't have that last layer sorted out, these things won't reach the patients. 
And this is, you know, as much as the top two layers are challenging from a scientific point of view, and we're getting very good at um, being as nonlinear as sciences, if you see where the COVID-19 vaccine came from, it came for research of mRNA vaccine for cancer. So you can see that science is not linear, it's never been linear. And with the incredible cooperation that we have now, even on a global level, uh, but in Europe, we have fantastic, you know, through our public-private partnerships, we, we make very good strides. But if that last layer there, if the European health systems are not able to capture, to welcome, to include those advances it makes no difference at the end of the day to the patients and and as always you know it's great not to talk about COVID-19 for once so or not to talk about it too much but COVID-19 has will force us to reimagine our healthcare systems right because we are you know if the 2009 uh, 2008 financial crisis was a hit on our healthcare systems this is going to be even stronger and really focused on our healthcare systems so so now we need to really take that opportunity of reduce budgets, uh, to, to reform and rethink about how we can adapt our healthcare systems to welcome new innovation. And it's in all those areas. It's in, you know, spreading more widely the new financing models that have been used in many countries for many of these new therapies. You know, let's learn. We've published a report, I think it was last summer, uh, on, on the different ways different countries are introducing some of these incredible let's have more let's share more let's have more countries learning from others and adapting as technology advances that, that patient um voice and it was so great to have donna on the call today uh, on the on the event today let's see you know what makes a difference to patients but also how did these innovations that sometimes are cures or or sometimes cause such a mexican wave of revolution down the whole healthcare system what impacts do they have? What savings do they cause? What, what changes in therapies do they cause? And so how can we really introduce them in a sustainable way and perhaps make some savings in some places, perhaps we may need to make some investments in other, in other sides, but we need to do that in collaboration. We need to discuss, we can't just in, put a technological bomb as we are as an industry and say, here, here you go, here's a CAR T, enjoy. It doesn't work like that, right? Because for, at the moment, CAR T's means taking the cells out of a, a patient, changing them and putting them back in. It's not something that most hospitals can actually do. So for, as an example, so I think that sort of integrated care and a reflection on, okay, we have these new technologies, how do they help and how can they actually be introduced on a longer term? And then there's the whole real world data how do we, and it was the biggest, the thing that got the biggest thing in the poll, right? How do we follow the progression of the disease with these new therapies? How can we, how can we be sure it's a cure, but also how can we introduce them as quickly as possible, knowing that then we can collect some real world data later. And, you know, we've made strides in digitization because of COVID, we've had to, right? We've had to communicate. So let's build on what we've had to do. The pharma strategy um, has a huge, wonderful chapter around digitization and making systems and interoperable and we're really excited about that but we need that there for these kind of therapies um, to make them effective and a lot of them are also based on diagnose, diagnosing what the patient needs otherwise you know the whole point of personalized is not is not going to be met and then the the regulatory pathways need to be adapted to welcome and the pharma strategy has a lot of focus on making sure that the European regulatory pathways are fit for purpose and we're really we look forward Pierre to working in partnership like you mentioned to make sure that whatever we set up now is works for today but also for the next 20 years not that in two years time we have to change them again so really that we can learn also on a global level what other parts of the world are doing learn from each other and get more and more convergent and i know there's a big part in the pharma strategy on, on global convergence which will make us more effective more impactful but also more attractive um, for investments because we were talking about that and talking about investments then also the famous you know having that research ecosystem that enables us to continue to attract investments and go from basic research to innovative products, innovative therapies, and do the clinical trials in Europe as well. Because why is it important? It's not just important so that you have a good ecosystem. It's important so that patients are in those clinical trials and already receive some of those treatments. That's something that sometimes people forget about clinical trials, but it's not just important because it shows how vibrant the research in a, in a, in a certain region is, but it's, they're crucially important for patients as well. So I think those, those five pillars that actually follow the, 
the journey of the of the development of the of the medicines are, are really important so the valuing and, and rewarding innovation at the beginning having the right incentive frameworks having the right frameworks to allow for clinical trials to have you know research etc collaborations the right regulatory pathways to get speedy approvals and use real world evidence the the right um, pricing and reimbursement models to make sure that this is sustainable introduction of these really exciting new technologies that are coming down the line and then that the whole care system is integrated to be able to welcome them and, and make the most of the value of those products i mean if if you are like we did have a, have a, like we do have a cure for hepatitis c and you're getting rid of liver transplants how can you make the most of that saving in the healthcare system that now has been adapted to deal with that and then uh, and then you know getting really making sure that patients are integrated throughout uh, uh, the whole journey so yeah that's i know i get very excited when i talk about <laughs> about these things um, and like i said it's 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 something by the way that the industry is doing anyway and that i find I find important to mention as well, you know, we're all focused on COVID, COVID vaccines, therapies, diagnostics, and our industry is working on all those things. And, but we haven't left these, these things behind. And I hope that the general public realizes that COVID comes on top and that um, our industry at the moment is under an incredible strain to be able to continue to do both what we what we have been doing with the pipeline products that you've just seen and the many others that are um, also there. Um, and COVID. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing those come to patients uh, as quickly as possible. Natalie, thank you for your insights and summing up there, those, those five key areas then that would really help take this forward. Uh, it's been a really interesting discussion. It's fascinating to feel the passion um, that I can hear from all the speakers and from Natalie, from you there, absolute passion and commitment to try to drive this forward with patients at the center of what's needed, that unmet need, um, and also thinking about the therapeutic areas where patients can be brought in early what's needed on the regulation, um, what, what the European Commission can do, um, looking what, what industry can do, and, and what a year, inevitably, we have to dwell on those lessons and that acceleration. And when the public's saying, look, if you can get a, a vaccine out there in the tenth of the time, come on, um, there's the challenge to the pharmaceutical industry. So some amazing points. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Natalie, it's lovely to have you sum up there. Uh, thanks again to all the speakers who've put their most interesting insights. I'm really grateful to everybody and to everybody out there who's joined us from, from all over. Keep the conversation going. Um, there are links which are up in the chat and, and the Q&A there so that you could have a look. There's more on the FPA website. There are all sorts of links available to find out more. But for now, thank you all very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. Bye now. <laughs>